Hi, I'm Dr. Peterson with Region EMS. Let's spend some time reviewing several of the new hazardous materials and environmental emergency guidelines. Quick disclaimer here, decontamination is an operational process. Each agency should have appropriate decon procedures in place which you should be familiar with, and none of the Region EMS guidelines address the logistics of decontamination. If decon is necessary, please provide early notification to MRCC so hospital resources can be activated. Many hospitals will require additional decon prior to entry if patients were decontaminated on scene. This is generally just overly cautious policy and not necessarily a statement about the competency of your decon skills as emergency responders. Let's start with guideline 62, chemical burns and exposures. The most important principle for dealing with chemical burns is to ensure that you are not putting yourself or anyone else at risk. If possible, identify the substance or substances involved and obtain Material Safety Data Sheets, or MSDS. Appropriate decontamination procedures should be performed, and at that point, you would now treat the patient similar to a thermal burn. However, there are two unique situations which require a modified treatment plan. The first would be exposure to carbolic acid, also known as phenol. Phenol is most commonly found in the production of plastics and some pharmaceutical substances. Phenol is highly hydrophobic, so the initial irrigation would be most effective if an alcohol-based substance is used, typically either isopropyl alcohol or polyethylene glycol. Water can be used if nothing else is available, but copious amounts should be used to ensure that the, the substance is fully decontaminated. The other special situation involves exposure to hydrofluoric acid. This is one of the strongest acids known, and as such is commonly used for glass etching, metal cleaning, and electronics manufacturing. Hydrofluoric acid penetrates deep into body tissues and causes severe pain and injury even if minimal surface injury is present. Most industrial sites that use hydrofluoric acid should have an exposure kit available with a calcium gluconate solution. This is the primary treatment for hydrofluoric acid burns and should be liberally and continuously applied until the patient's pain is relieved. As long as there is pain, the acid is continuing to cause damage, so this is a situation where pain medication should not be given. You should actually be applying more calcium gluconate gel as long as the symptoms persist. Respiratory exposure with symptoms should be treated with nebulized calcium gluconate, not calcium chloride, which is what is typically carried in the ambulance. Calcium gluconate is not typically carried in the ambulance, but if it is available as part of the hydrofluoric acid exposure kit at the workplace, it may be used. If your patient displays any evidence of hemodynamic instability, make sure you have adequate vascular access and then you can administer IV calcium chloride every 10 minutes as needed. Contact MRCC and the Poison Control Center early for additional management advice. Moving on, let's skip ahead to guideline 65, radiation incidents. Electrical burns, thermal burns, and blast injuries are covered in a separate trauma video. Radiation incidents are fortunately very rare, but this is a real threat for the region's EMS service area. The Prairie Island Nuclear Generating Plant is just south of the Twin Cities in Red Wing, Minnesota. Cottage Grove is a receiving site for evacuees in the event of a radiation incident in this area, and Regions Hospital is the preferred receiving hospital. This is just an example. There are other situations where patients might be exposed to radioactive substances. Unfortunately, though, there is not much to do for radiation victims other than a thorough decontamination. The acute medical care does not change. Any specific complaints or traumatic injuries should be addressed according to the appropriate guidelines. Once a patient has been exposed to radiation, there are no emergent interventions that can reverse the damaging effects and symptoms typically will take hours or even days to develop. The backside of the radiation incident guideline contains additional information for dealing with radiation exposure and should be reviewed periodically. Now let's discuss heat and cold stress. Since we work in Minnesota and Wisconsin, we deal with both extremes of temperature. Guideline 67 deals with the management of hyperthermia and heat-related emergencies. One of the most important interventions to address with an environmental emergency is to extricate the patient from the environment to a climate-controlled location. A lot of these patients initially appear quite sick, but with 15 to 20 minutes of rest, 
cooling, and hydration, they can turn around fairly dramatically. You should also review the Special Event Rehab Guideline, number 74, for additional techniques for managing environmental stress. Heat stroke is an imminent life threat. At this point, the patient has developed altered mental status and often has even stopped sweating, which limits their ability to dissipate their body heat. Typically, these patients are hot, dry, altered, or comatose, and occasionally even seizing. These patients need to be cooled immediately in order to prevent death or permanent brain damage. I would even consider delaying transport of these patients if it is possible to immerse them in cold water on scene, such as in a bathtub. They need to be cooled immediately. You should be aggressive with airway management and fluid resuscitation. And if your patient begins shivering during the cooling process, contact MRCC for guidance on the use of benzos or even vecuronium to limit this inappropriate heat production. On the other end of the spectrum are hypothermia and frostbite, otherwise known as Guideline 68. Most cases are minor and only require basic supportive care for localized injuries. Systemic symptoms, such as an altered mental status, require some critical thought and important decisions. There is a theoretical concern for cardiac instability with severely hypothermic patients. There are scattered reports across the country of patients suddenly going into ventricular fibrillation with movement and handling, but this has not been shown to be consistent. Still, you should use caution with severely hypothermic patients and limit the amount of physical handling done to the patient if possible. What's actually more concerning is a phenomenon called afterdrop. This occurs with moderate and severe hypothermia when the patient's body responds to external warming attempts by dilating its blood vessels. This causes the return of cold, acidic blood from the arms and legs into the core circulation. This then causes a further temporary drop in the core body temperature and can even precipitate sudden cardiovascular collapse. The preferred way to warm severely hypothermic patients would be active internal rewarming with heated IV fluids, chest tubes, and other significantly invasive techniques. Active internal rewarming and active external rewarming should not be attempted in patients in the pre-hospital setting who have cooled beyond the point of shivering because of concerns about the afterdrop phenomenon. These patients really need aggressive active internal rewarming which should really only be done at a hospital. They should have any wet clothing removed but no further rewarming beyond that. Anyone with significant hemodynamic issues or mental status changes should be transported to Regions Hospital so that the appropriate burn and trauma resources would be available if needed. As with any rarely used skill, these guidelines should be reviewed periodically so that you maintain familiarity with the management of these conditions. Whenever an unusual situation presents itself, please keep in mind that MRCC operators are always available to clarify the appropriate guideline or connect you with a physician to provide direct medical guidance. As always, feel free to contact the Regions EMS staff with any questions or concerns.